Hi, I'm Daniel Coombs, and the August What Sneeze is going to start right now. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Caboose, sharing our passion for trains since 1938. This is What's Neat for August 2018. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month, Ron Pear comes by all the way from Canada and shows us how to color brick buildings and add details to them. We look at Rick Huntrod's beautiful HON3 layout, its gorgeous Colorado scenery all in a room size layout. We also look at Pete Doty's HO scale wharf layout, Mike Buddy stops by this month and shows us how to make wrecked load freight cars and automobiles using aluminum foil. Dave Davis and I lay a section of track about 11 feet long with jointed rail and joint bars with a complete sound effect to go along with that. And of course we've got Stephen M. Conroy's beautiful drone footage from Southern California of Union Pacific Business Train with number 1943 locomotive on the lead. So it's gorgeous California drone footage this month to look at. And that's the lineup for August 2018, What's Neat? Hi, I'm Mike Buddy. For this segment of uh, What's Neat this week, we're going to do a recap of the uh, aluminum foil technique that uh, we talked about in past episodes. I think it was Tyler Sneed that brought this up on Facebook uh, of the wrecked freight cars and scrap, scrap loads that you can use foil for. Uh, this, we did this one uh, in one of the uh, prior episodes. I'm sure uh, Daniel can, can tell which one it was. And uh, I also used the foil technique to do this auto rack, damaged auto rack too, with the vehicles inside. So to, this time I'm going to concentrate more on showing you the vehicles and how I do damage on the vehicles to be pretty realistic. So these these vans inside here were were crushed from both ends, and now these vans were just picked up. These are the ones that represent vans that were drivable enough to get back on the auto rack but you can see that the damage where you blend the foil into the original model it can be pretty realistic once it's painted and weathered and, and, and scraped and everything so I'm going to show you how to do that uh, just take a piece of foil these are those cheap vans that everybody was getting from Walmart a few years ago and I would prepare a van, if I was going to crush in the top, I would take another van and, and cut out the portion of, that I was going to uh, do damage to. This way, take a Kleenex, Q-tip, finger, get it, and the longer you, you spend on it, the neater job you will get, get out of it. So, you can see how you get the basic shape if you're careful and take your time, unlike what I'm doing here. I don't know if you can see around that auto rack. Where you get the corners, you'll have to uh, fold over. You gotta try and plan your folds so that you can really compress it down along the sides. Anyway, when you get, get to a casting you like, cut it out around the outline of a vehicle, maybe along, along a door seam, a place where it will be easy to blend into the other vehicle put the foil piece on top of the car that you have cut out. In this case, I had a van that I had cut the corner out. Then I added plastic doors. I 
bent the bumper up a little bit and just had a little bit of fun with that. So here's some other cars that I've, I've done using the same technique foil, making uh, different parts. Here's the same thing, this uh, little 55 Chevy that's got hit from behind. Do the same thing, just take a piece of foil and try and plan where your uh, corners are going to be so you can sort of hide that crease. And, and you'll master it after a while, after you do it a few times. Uh, I would mold this all, all the way up to the door, cut, cut the door seam, right at the door seam there, outline the wheel wells and everything, and glue it on there, paint it, and then carefully bend it. So, I don't know, uh, some of you might have seen the Volkswagen scrapyard full of uh, wrecked VWs that I did. I think Ken has some, some footage of that. But way a good way to uh, use foil for other things is it's really good for fences around that scrapyard. I had pieces of four by eight siding. I made that. This is a piece of a Rick's Products uh, warehouse, modern warehouse. I would cut an eight foot scale high strip of foil, and then do the same thing carefully. I'm in a big hurry now, but carefully make a nice long strip a decent impression when you get it the way you like it turn it over and uh, put some Elmer's glue or white glue on this spread it out a little bit and let it dry overnight that way when it's, it's dry in the morning that will give a lot of strength to this and then in the case of the scrap yard I made uh, two long strips of this one green and one white and then I cut it into four foot pieces so it was four by eight sheets and alternated those on the, uh, the, the scrap yard fence. So you can use foil for all kinds of things besides fences, uh, make impressions of corrugated siding, corrugated metal, like for awnings. Uh, I made a Quonset hut that's, in, that's visible in one of the uh, Volkswagen scrap yard photos. There's a Quonset hut. I made all the foil the same way. Um, it's good for uh, all kinds of details, scrap metal and freight and uh, gondolas and junkyards, but uh, you can use your imagination with it. I'm sure you can find a, a lot of other uses, but it's something that a lot of people overlook and it's fun to try, so give it a try. And I'll talk to you next time on What's Deep This Week. For this segment of What's Neat, I've got a real treat today. I'm with Pete Doty, who appears to model a beautiful railroad along the water, the wharf scene, the whole bit. Pete, what's the name of this gorgeous layout? This is the Seattle Terminal Railway District, and it is a conglomeration of seven different railroads that came into Seattle at various times. It was led by the Great Northern, who actually created Seattle as a terminal, and so it, it ended at Seattle. Very cool. And so what era is this layout? 1948, post-war, jobs are scarce, operators and engineers are very excited to be working for a guy named Nash who uh, drives around the district and writes train orders for them. <laughs> and when he sees a locomotive or a crew that's sitting there not doing anything, he hands them the order. Now it looks like all your buildings are sort of built at an angle on this wharf area where you've got your street running. I'm really impressed with the way you've designed that. What maybe you come up with that angle design? I did a lot of research on Seattle and that's actually how the wharves were built. So I built all these with scratch. There is one that is a uh, Walther's kit that I messed around with and it's right in the middle of the layout, the big gray. Uh, I remember that one. Yeah. I shot the ad photos for that a long time ago. Yeah. Built all those scenes. Municipal Pier. Yep. Very nice. There you go. Very nice. Now, also, I see you've got a lot of trackage on here. What's your preferred trackage that you use? I'm using Code 100. 
and Pico turnouts. Code 100 Atlas and Pico turnouts. And I think your DCC, what type of system do you like? NCE. So it NCE. works good for you to use yeah. the radio throttles? Well, there's a couple things that go hand in hand. My operating group uses it, and the guy across the street named Dave Klingman is kind of an expert. He uses it too, so. <laughs> you said the magic word, operating. Do you operate this layout? Yes, six operators or five operators and one clerk. And the clerk is actually the dispatcher. If you notice over my shoulder here, there's a pickle board. And uh, we call it, what do we call that? Oh yeah, Clyde. It's a car location indication device experiment. That's awesome. So you've got all these guys that get together and operate with you. And wouldn't you say part of the magic of this hobby is those folks that you meet? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we get together for lunch once a week, just a bunch of us, diverse interests. Uh, we enjoy each other's company. Uh, to, to paraphrase um, a gal at the funeral of her husband, I miss Chuck. Uh, but she said it's an extraordinary group of gentlemen and I just you know we don't have a lot of cussing and swearing the wives actually <laughs> like each other and so it's you know it's a it's a good group that good sounds group. awesome Pete well thank you very much for sharing this with the viewers of what's neat my pleasure <laughs>
what's neat, while Dave and I are enjoying a cup of coffee, you don't remember Dave Davis as really being into track work, and he's discussed a lot of things about track with us, but tonight we were talking about the old joint bar rail length. The, the joint and what was how the, long was the rails? Thirty nine feet. Uh, thirty nine feet six inches. So thirty nine and a half. So, so thirty nine and a half was... feet is how far, which created an old familiar rhythm, a sound that if you've ever heard as a, as a child, the sound of a freight train going over a jointed rail segment rail, thirty nine and a half feet staggered. Like they all said, clickety clack. Right. Clickety -clack, it's a, it's, it's a sound that's almost like familiar to you, but you haven't heard it in a long time and you didn't even know you knew that sound but it's immediately recognizable when you hear it. Now I've got a section of track that runs through the laundry room sink area here and I'd like to notch out the rails because what it'll do is it'll allow the train to be a little bit more audible, a little bit I can hear it from the other side of the shop and know when it's over here. I did the jointed rail as you'll recall on one section of my layout towards the front and we couldn't hear the TV. Yes. So I relayed that track with smooth welded rail because it was actually too much. So let's do that now. Let's take a Dremel motor tool and we've got one right here set up with the small Dremel bits that come in a container and let's just notch out the top of our rail and wherever we put a joint bar on the track everywhere we notch it at 39 and a half feet it'll be pr prototypically correct with regards to sound and aesthetics. and aesthetics so let's see how this comes out when we run a train through it after we notch it out So I've notched out about eight feet of main line running underneath these cabinets to create the sound effect now that we're after. The Dremel disc that I use is in fact a little bit thicker than the ones that come in this small container. It's about, it's under a 32nd of an inch, but that'll give us a good wide gap to enhance the sound, which won't affect the performance of the train in any negative way. Now while, while I was notching this out, I noticed that the track was not glued down. So rather than to use silicone glue as I normally do, I used a little bit of Elmer's wood glue, which will give a very firm surface and enhance the sound. So now with that, let's run a train through this segment of main line and listen to the old rhythm of the rails. For this segment of What's Neat, we're in Colorado Springs. We're with Rick Hunt Rods, and we're gonna look at this beautiful HON3 layout that he's built. Now you've seen me work with Blackstone models for almost two years, and we've tried everything, but I'm telling you what, it appears that Rick has nailed it. Look at the backdrop behind me. Look at the colors. Look at all of this stuff. This is amazing. Tell us well, about this thanks layout. A thanks a lot. Yeah, I started this layout in 2008. Uh, I had a previous HON3 layout that I'd worked on since 94, and it got to a point of completion, I'd had some articles published on it, and I felt like there wasn't a lot more I could do. And I had some ideas I wanted to do, and I wanted to go with sort of a proto freelance is what I did here. So I modeled Bridgeway Yard, I've got Vance Junction, I've got Ofer, I've got Bridge 45A coming into Ofer, and the rest of it is pretty much Southwest Colorado scenery and scenes that look like Southwest Colorado with my own ideas for structures and things like that. The nice thing about this, Rick, is that you've chosen a space that's not too much. It just seems like it's the right size, but you've still encapsulated Ofer and Ridgeway, and it's just amazing that you were able to do this in such a small space. What is the total space you think this is? 
the layout's roughly 12 by 15. 12 by 15 is yeah. almost a room size layout that anybody yeah. can have. Yeah, yeah. And when I started this, we moved into this house in 1998. And I thought about doing what a lot of people do is just take over the room and fill the whole room around the edges or something like that. But I thought I would rather have something a little more manageable. And I'm really, really into scenery a lot. And I wanted something that would get to a reasonable stage of completion in a reasonable amount of time. So to be honest with you, you don't see a lot of really big layouts that have a lot of fine detail on them. And I just like a lot of detail. Lots of figures, lots of cars, lots of structures that look complete. That's great. Now, what would you guess is the height of your bench work, your track height? The, the normal, the, the starting height of the bench work is about 42 inches. And that's a good height for viewing, is it? Good height for viewing. Some people like higher. Some people like higher because it looks like you're looking across the scenery. Um, I can sit on my stool and, and be at that level and I do that and it works just fine. Now are you a lone wolf modeler or did you design this layout to operate with other fellas? I'm pretty much a lone wolf so and I did all of this myself from the bench work all the way through to scenery completion, the structures, rolling stock, electrical. Uh, putting DCC in brass locomotives, all of that. I, do I was going to ask everything. you, what kind of DCC system do you like? I'm using NCE, NCE, and then I use all Soundtracks decoders and everything. Great. I'm telling you what, we're going to just, we're feasting our eyes on this as we're, as you're talking. It's just eye candy. Beautiful job in a small space. Thanks a Very lot. respected. Thank you for sharing this with the viewers of What's Neat. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. <laughs>
structure or detail kits that they have you can add these to any model now this building is called the Allstate factory with the extension on top and both of these kits come with these roof detail portions and um, I'm going to build the the vent that uh, we have for this building and uh, as our last part of the segment here so this is a separately purchased roof detail kit however like I said these details come with these kits so uh, if you've got an extra building that you want to put details on like a, a water tower on the roof or some air conditioners or uh, chimneys ladders uh, uh, roof access all this stuff is available in this kit and, but what we're going to work on today are these vent pieces that we glue together so pull them out of the sheet two, I think there's three different sizes here but we'll work on two for now so all you do with these is you put them all together and you glue them with your wood glue and uh, we'll be right back after we have glued all these pieces together. So we're, we have, we've glued these off camera just to make it better. Like who wants to watch glue dry, right? So uh, we have these put together and we've taken the little uh, structure bands off of the sheet to put them onto the, the venting itself. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use two different paints here. This is a dark pewter gray and a, a lighter timeless gray. And it doesn't really matter which gray we use. We're just using a darker gray to start with. And then we're gonna come back with a little bit of a lighter gray to add a modulation in between each of the little panels. So nice and quick here. my glue out of the cap paint it on fairly liberally let's see that here so while the paints dry we're gonna take our lighter paint we're not gonna add too much of it and I need a place to put down um, just gonna get in between here and kind of dab it in a bit this adds your shadows in between just a little bit of variation kind of finishes up the coloring another good way to get this out is to use your finger spread it out as long as it's a little blotchy that's what we're looking for blotchy is not a problem it's exactly what we want like that so now that we've got our piece together the glue side I'm gonna bring this out and we're going to show that these little details almost immediately even finished add a bunch to the layout just right off the bat like that so now that we've got our little vent done we can add a, a roof breather here uh, that's an easy one to make just three pieces glue it together paint it gray uh, we have a chimney here we can make um, and the other pieces to this chimney are right here. Just paint these uh, oxide red or burnt orange again. That was a fail on camera. So let's get to building some more of these parts. We're not going to get all of them done because we've got a lot of them on the roof right here. As you can see, the roof access is right here. Uh, the water tower is right here. And all these other parts are here. So let's do a roof vent here to get started. I'm gonna use, instead of my wood glue this time, we're gonna use a little bit of crazy glue so that we can 
get it glued a little bit quicker but I advise to use wood glue because it works really well on this product. Or as a matter of fact, I use Weld Bond all the time. <laughs> I could go on and on about Weld Bond. <laughs> so like I said, it's really uh, an easy part to come together. This crazy glue just take a couple of seconds for me. Make sure it sets before you let it go. Come back, we're going to paint this little piece up. Once again, we want to brush off most of the paint so we get all that fine detail to come through. If you fill up the detail, don't worry, you really once it dries, it will actually release. It'll thin out and uh, allow that detail to show through. However, you know, just try to paint light on it. On these edges, they're kind of dark. If you want to get rid of the darkness, sand them down. They'll turn light beige. However, two or three coats of paint will easily uh, cover them up nicely. We've got the base of our chimney that we glued all of our uh, uh, micro ply sheets to. And uh, we are going to first clean off this darn brush. And then we're going to paint it with some terracotta. So, like I said, we got a little bit of terracotta here. We're going to put it on the panel, brush off the excess. We don't want lots of excess because there's a lot of etched detail in this brick. I'm going to paint this in nice and nice so there's not too much variation. It's good to have a solid base coat on this. Like I said, not too much paint, but a solid color. Like I said with the other piece, if you've got the, the burnt edges, if they're not coming through nice on you, I just tend to spend a little bit more time on them, make sure there's a a good coat of paint on it. Not thick, but just a good coat of paint. Now this chimney is not going to get mortar like the other parts of the building. It takes too long for that, for the performance really. It takes 24 hours for it to dry. And when it goes on, it doesn't look like mortar. But when you wake up in the morning, it does. So, so now that we have these all painted up, we're gonna quickly put a little bit of Glue, like I said, I prefer wood glue or weld bond for oh, this. We've got our little detail parts. We can bring our model over here. I'll throw a chimney over here. Maybe in the, maybe let's put it on the. How do you want it? You want it there? Good. Yeah, I think I want it there too. So that's the Allstate factory with the extension uh, by ITLAScaleModels.com. My name is Ron Perry or just another scale modeler on YouTube and that's this segment for What's Neat. All of the model railroad products seen in this episode of What's Neat are available through Caboose in Lakewood, Colorado or order online at mycaboose.com.